So, um, good evening, everyone, and salam alaikum uh, to everyone uh, of you and the listeners out there. Thank you for joining in. And I am uh, Fozia Peer, uh, the chairperson of uh, Minara Business and Professional Women, and also the vice president of Minara Chamber of Commerce. And of course, also the chair of uh, Muslim Relief Alliance. Um, so I want to welcome all of you today and our distinguished speakers. And uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Ashwanti will join us uh, very soon. And you know, with these um, virtual meetings, we have to be uh, on time because uh, sometimes, you know, they just cut you off when the time goes. So anyway, thank you speakers for accepting our invite and thank you to Amina, our administrator of the chamber for putting this together. So um, the theme uh, that um, uh, Halima has chosen with all of us is women building a better future for all South Africa. I must say it was quite a difficult topic. I, I don't know, but uh, you know, I just thought to myself, now how on earth are we going to build ourselves with this, all what has happened lately? So uh, ladies, <clears throat> does it feel like uh, 2020, 2021 uh, went on forever? I don't know, I felt that way, you know. And did lockdown drag, I felt even lockdown had dragged like crazy non-stop and can you even remember how you spent your time when you were not living under uh, coronavirus restrictions i'm even forgetting that i'm forgetting the days that are passing so fast as well and you're not alone we all are part of it and will time regain its regular rhythm i don't know it's difficult to say uh, with the vaccines being deployed, we may be more hopeful than ever that normality is just around the corner. I mean, notwithstanding all the conspiracy theories that are going around, and many of them don't want to take the vaccines, and all sorts of theories are coming over that you die with it, and and, and some kind of funny things happen to you electronically, and all sorts of things, but uh, anyway, beside the headaches, I don't think, and the pain on the arm, I haven't witnessed anything really drastic. Um, so the reality may be that yes, normality in a few months, hopefully we say inshallah, God willing. So um, ladies, you know, the riots have mostly taken place um, uh, in the province of KwaZulu-Natal and Kauteng, and not so bad as Kauteng. And, and at that time, if you recall that Kauteng was uh, in the epicenter of the resurgence of COVID-19 and with the dominant Delta variant. And from what I'm hearing now uh, with many of the residents of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Phoenix, and according to them, the COVID-19 has really increased in Phoenix. A lot of them, uh, I know for a fact that our, my husband's uh, PA had to uh, go home today because she discovered that the entire family has COVID because the kids from school had brought the COVID to the family. And she was quite worried about her mother-in-law being quite old. So, so, um, it's it's firing, I must say, and it's not stopping. So so the looting and the unrest has caused this, I, I think. So the effect of the looting is evident on, on the small and the big businesses, as well as the economy, increasing unemployment and making it difficult for businesses to recover their losses. And I'm sure all the ladies are going to give us a good insight into it. However, there are ripple effects, uh, which are not as clear. But 
mind you, I can say that um, we living in South Africa and, and, you know, South Africa was mired in, in recession before the pandemic struck us. There was huge unemployment. Lots of shops have closed down. Lots of restaurants were crying. And, and this unrest has load, you know, has caused, uh, um, I would say, an extra burden on, on what was going on. So that was my introduction. And if I may just um, introduce uh, our speaker for tonight, uh, Halima Kunochi. Halima is also a, a board member of uh, the Muslim Relief Alliance. She's on the executive. And her topic for today is uh, from 16 days to 365 days. How can we implement strategy? Now, if I recall, I, that was the book that she had written. Uh, and Halima is currently the chief uh, director for capacity building, chief director under the local government wing as the, as, uh, the Copter uh, Kesedin Department. And she has worked in all three spheres of government. And she, you know, for many years, she was in national parliament as a human HR uh, uh, manager. And she was also a senior in, in, in provincial government which is presently on senior management and um, of, of course on strategy, uh, working closely with the citizens and um, all the academic institutions. So as I said earlier on that uh, Halima is a published author and must get hold of her book. It's a fantastic book uh, that she has written. She will tell us the name, the book, The Smarter Municipality. Uh, against the ills of local government. And mind you, our president had signed that book and many other um, MECs as well. So, um, you know, we've got a dynamic woman here with us. And unfortunately, or fortunately, she's recovered from a, a major um, operation. And um, when I looked at her just now, she looks incredibly well. And uh, she's doing fantastic. She's recovering. So thank God for that. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, she's on capacity building. So Halima, your second book I know is on gender equity in the workplace. And that is what you're going to cover now, but not so much the book, but how are we going to move forward from 16 days to 365 days, how to uh, implement a strategy. So um, I now would give you uh, the opportunity, Halima Konote, uh, to take the floor. And beside, be before we do that, thank, uh, uh, welcome to all those speakers that are there. I see uh, Adila is here as well, and uh, his, uh, Her Excellency uh, Princess Mukalele Zulu. She's here with us looking fabulous. Both of y'all, and I don't know if Ashwante has uh, is on or not yet, but we'll wait for her. Um, anyway, Halima, you can carry on now. Thank unmute you. yourself. Thanks. Yes, uh, I just unmuted myself. Um, thank you so much, um, Councillor Peer. Um, thank you for that introduction, and I'd like to greet all the um, panelists, um, Her Excellency, um, uh, Her Royal Highness, Princess Mugalidile, and uh, all the other uh, uh, guests that we have here today. I think uh, for me, I must say um, it's a real honor to be part of this um, gathering as we are on um, Women's Month in the country. But um, I move from the premise as my um, topic would state that we should be vigorous in the agenda towards gender equity. 
Hence, I felt um, two years ago, um, the concept of gender should be a continuing one. Um, hence, the topic is from 16 days to 365 days. I think uh, the 16 days, because there was a lot of emphasis, and I think that's one of the key activities that take place in this country um, that we participate on having to vigorously deal with gender issues and femicide um, during the 16 days of um, um, gender-based violence uh, or against gender-based violence. And I wanted us, us to have a, a concept of moving away from that. Um, I know the person that came up with um, the um, commemoration or rather having to deal with the issue of gender-based violence um, and conceptualizing it over the 16 days was wishing well, but I felt that we needed to move beyond that premise as a country and we needed to understand what we need to do. Um, I think the book largely advises and puts in place strategy towards how any institution can um, have a gender friendly environment um, knowing that um, there are various um, pl platforms that we as um, a country participate on. And I think today for me, coming from uh, all that has been said and all that uh, the country has been going through, we've had um, the lockdown, the COVID in the entire world, it's changed our dynamics and the way we look at things. And it's also, escalated um, the issue of gender equity. Because as a premise, I think for me, everything is based on things being equal. What causes the gender-based violence? It's because of our historical beliefs in all the echelons of our lives, be it religious, be it uh, 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 traditional, as in the various religions and the various traditional traditions that we have and the various races, because from the time we are growing up, we are taught that as a female, you are not necessarily lesser of a person, but you are second to a male. And that has played itself out in all the areas of our lives, be it at work, be it um, um, in the economic field of our lives, um, because as women, um, you were felt you needed to come second to man. And now we need to unlearn those particular aspects as we move on with, with life. And unlearning is all these strategies that we are saying need to be put in place, whether it's at schools, um, the girl child and the, boy, uh, and the boy child need to understand that they are equal. And I think if we can already start putting particular streams in our daily lives to understand the issue of equity as a standpoint, it would then be easier for us to move um, on. Because if we get to understand what equity is and why it is so important, it is basically about ensuring that every individual has an equal opportunity to make the most of their life and talents. And therefore, you are at the same footing as any other person. So for me, um, I believe that as a country, we need to move away from having to have policy, but not implement it. Um, I want to understand that also the pandemic taught us how vigilant we can be as a country. Um, I think uh, when it was announced a state of disaster, our politicians were able to lead the plight towards us having to protect the country and its people. And there were various activities that had to be undertaken. And for me, I feel that we must, um, since our president has even announced that um, gender-based violence and femicide is a second pandemic already, we must emulate some of the actions that we have been taking around COVID and have these actions 
take place around the issue of gender-based violence. For instance, we have updates on um, how many people have been infected almost on a daily basis. And I do not understand why there isn't a special vehicle that is also created within the country to allow us to understand on a daily basis how many women are if affected um, around the issue on the issue of gender-based violence because this would alert us and would also allow us to understand where we are sitting at. I was really horrified to learn that uh, you know we rank uh, quite highly amongst the world as being one of the dangerous countries to be in because of the number of murders. And when you look at murders uh, that take place in this country, the statistic also pronounced that these murders are largely women. You know, women are being murdered by men. And um, this has increased since the lockdown. And of course, there are various activities that um, uh, contribute to this. People are, 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 are very stressed um, because some of them have lost their jobs. Emotionally, they are drained. They are, they are, they are having a strain in their personal lives. People have been together uh, more than apart. And um, I've seen some of the jokes that circulate um, on social media around um, you know, people just uh, having to be in the same space as in a woman and, 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 and a man. And yes, we may say that those are jokes, but those are some of the things that filter into uh, the violence that we see taking place in, in, in our country. So for me, I think some of the recommendations, I would uh, really want to join a lot of women um, in pronouncing on to say that there really needs to be a vehicle at a national level, as uh, there is um, the council that sits on, on, on COVID that updates um, the citizens on the status of gender-based violence and the implementations that happen in each province and now we have the district development model as well within a province because that is the new program that government has developed. So even the gender-based uh, 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 violence activity or recording or announcing on should be a standard agenda item so that we can understand where we are at. Are all the departments participating? Because yes, we do um, at this time during this month have the women's parliament where all departments present what they have done. And we really applaud our government for having taken the strides that they have. But the question is, is it enough? I just uh, was so horrified to hear that um, a lot of students or rather a few students over this uh, particular month even uh, one uh, last week, Wednesday, I think, and another one on Saturday, were brutally murdered by their partners. And this tells you um, the, the gravity of the problem that we have. And I wonder, are we knowing about this because we are on Women's Month? Um, is it not something that continues happen that continues to happen in our institutions of higher learning and uh, one would say that uh, I mean why would you want to uh, elude to um, an institution of higher learning for me this is where our youth is at where most people who are at their peak of their lives are at in, in terms of the being future leaders and being future emulators of what we want the country to become at, at the end of the day. So really, government for me should really utilize the already existing uh, uh, um, avenues to implement um, the programs and the policies. I mean, we have excellent policies around gender-based violence and femicide, but I think they needs to be a little bit more effort in trying to ensure that each and every um, area is covered. Uh, we've seen that even um, children in, in primary schools, after having gone through uh, uh, you know, the, the stresses of being away from, uh, from school, 
uh, one child was reported having gone to school on the very first day and was sexually abused by the janitor. So for me, uh, really, there needs to be extensive, extensive awareness about what are the areas that should be looked at and who are the people that should participate. And I think I want to bring this back to each individual uh, because as a person, we are part of a country. And if each and every one of us, wherever we are, could do something to actually uh, ensure that there is consistent awareness. And I think the speakers that would come after me would speak more on the emotional side and the impact that the gender-based violence has, not only just on an individual, because if, for instance, a child gets abused, the whole community, uh, uh, there's a strain in the community and there's um, elements of, of, of division um, because the parents start um, actually blaming the teachers. And it, it's just, um, an area where we need to actually reinforce and work together towards ensuring that uh, at the end of the day, the aspects that are put in place are continuous. We've seen that um, in this province largely um, over uh, uh, last month, we, we, we suffered quite extensively from the lootings and the racial tension that has taken place. And if you look at why are we having such uh, 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 um, activities still rife in our society after we've been gone through democracy, you would understand that the issue of equality becomes a key role player because whether it is race, whether it is uh, 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 sex and whether it's economic power, as long as the inequality gap is huge and the equity is, 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 is glaringly um, a gap in a society, people would find a way to revolt against what they deem demeans them as a person, as a community, so that they can uh, um, uh, announce on, on, on their uh, dissatisfaction. And we've seen that really tearing our, our, our society apart in terms of uh, race in, in Durban and other areas within KZN. And you found the country really um, being felt sorry for by the world. We, we had the Pope actually praying for our country. And for me, it all boils down to areas of inequality because people then utilize this particular aspect to announce on their dissatisfaction and how they feel they are, are treated by the government. Um, really, I think for me, uh, we should take action in promoting equality and non-discrimination in our various areas. And, um, you know, I'm happy that today we also uh, have in our midst the very large uh, contingency of our playing field as a country, which is the traditional leadership area, because that's often uh, um, uh, um, an area where not much emphasis is put in, but we've seen that um, the unrest went as far as Nongoma where we call it the Hlalankosi, translated as the king's place where the, 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 the king um, uh, resides. And people, you could see the, the inequality also in the looting, because when every time I looked at the television, I saw men carrying TVs and I saw women uh, uh, who were part of, of the looting carrying food. So that tells you also the disparities between the two uh, 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 sexes. Men were more interested in, in, in uh, I, would, I would think, uh, things of value when women was more interested in an aspect that is, is of a nutritional value to 
herself and her family. So for me, uh, I believe that we should continue with the programs, but more importantly, the issue of equity uh, should be looked at quite extensively. And, um, um, you know, this, this issue plays out even in our, into our politics, because when you look at uh, the balance between the male and female, although there is, cons well, our government is trying and they are trying to be consistent in balancing the numbers, but is woman given power as well? Or is it just to make up the numbers and then say at the end of the day, as a country, we comply, we have uh, uh, you know, an equal number of women and men in, 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 in um, um, seats of power, because that's where the change must also be. And, um, and we must be involved as women, as part of the decision makers. And I was very uh, happy to understand that some of our women were in the forefront of um, uh, areas of trying to risk peace and synergy in our communities after the unrest that has taken place. So um, taking action is, is really one area for me that each and every one of us need to participate in. And uh, the economy as well. Uh, I'm glad that um, 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 Councillor Fosia Peer is with us as a woman leader for an extremely powerful organization like um, the, the Muslim uh, uh, Relief Alliance. I believe that uh, the work that they do resonates largely in ensuring that people are resourced uh, with regards to replenishing what they don't have. But I do wish that there could be more consistent interventions, such as bringing women together and providing support to them where they can sustain themselves. I know she has a, a huge passion about ensuring that after the relief is given, then what? Because the person needs to continue with their lives and they need to ensure that um, tomorrow they are able to feed their family. So for me, I do believe that um, the initiatives uh, just need to be reinforced with other initiatives that could be um, uh, long lasting in the communities. Um, we saw that an, a staple food um, or a staple element of, of food for us as a, a country such as bread uh, went um, uh, uh, missing during uh, the lootings because this particular resource is often in the hands of the big business. And uh, we saw that there was a uh, lot of women and groups circulating uh, recipes for making bread. And for me, it automatically brought a thought about to say, hang on, why can't the bakeries be in the communities? Why don't the women that don't have jobs who have lost their job due, due to the pandemic and cannot uh, um, cater for their families, be given support to come up uh, uh, and, and work in a, uh, their community, in a bakery environment where they could um, firstly support themselves by making the bread and selling it to the community. And uh, after a while, through, through some of the um, uh, uh, um, supply chain stores that we have around our communities. So some, something as simple as that requires a change and a shift in thought by community leaders and people that run our economy. There's been support uh, that is uh, handed out. And for me, I believe that the support should be actually directed in the area of uh, our communities sustaining themselves in the long run so that they get back into the mainstream of economy because they cannot be given the grant forever. And if we really uh, perpetuate having to have a consistent grant, then we are not really assisting um, uh, our, our country. So for me, I felt um, I needed to share these um, strategies. I hope um, I've able to cover most of them. Thank you so much. Sorry, Alima, I know you can 
you can go in, you know, using chapters of all kind of ideas, but uh, we have okay. to cut you down. <laughs> we'll give you another chance. No, thank you. I was day. just uh, rounding but up. Thank you so much. You. Thanks for the yeah. opportunity. Asima, I can assure you that you are not alone in this endeavor. Every day we encounter young women in the workplace environment who are trying to break new ground, you know, by challenging the status quo and succeeding. Government has made significant progress, I think, uh, in putting place uh, legislation and policy frameworks for advancing equality as well as empowerment of women. But then again, we need a yardstick to check how far has it reached the rural women and those that are in real need? Are we building entrepreneurship within them? Because if you sustain a woman and if you give her the opportunity, you'd never find any poverty in the area because you have to empower a woman. So thank you very much. I think we, we learned a lot from your ideas and I'm sure everyone should read your book um, and, and they will get much more insight into what you really trying to tell us. And um, definitely, I'm sure they will try and grab that. So our next speaker, thank you, Halima, once again. Our ne next speaker is Adila Pretorius. Now, Adila's qualification, um, she's an uh, ethnopsychologist and hypnotherapist. Um, God, I'd love to get hypnosis and forget all the past, you know, and, and go move forward, you know, all, all the, the things that hurt you most, you know. Um, yeah. And she's also uh, um, an L NLP, which is going to tell us what it is, a neurosemantic practitioner and live business relationships and communication coach. Fantastic. And, um, you know, it, it's so wonderful to have women with this kind of inspiration that they can give us. You know, she's, she's also, um, I think uh, she adjudicated uh, polygamy, uh, you know, uh, indiscreetly, she says, but um, you know where you should be going, um, Adila is in the Arab country <laughs> where, this polygamy is kind of um, uh, much in, uh, you know, uh, it moves very fast there. But also I hear even in our South African environment, um, it's kind of a hidden factor, but uh, you need to talk more on that, I think, to our men folks. So Adila's uh, topic for today, uh, for tonight is mental health, the space women are, and, uh, and in due to all that is happening, and that is COVID, um, looting, and loss of jobs. Um, very appropriate to what's happening presently. And maybe you can put some of your therapeutic um, uh, manifestations in all this and tell us exactly what, how you see uh, South Africa going with, with this. Thank you very much for coming over, Adila. Jazakla Khairan, um, Fozia, for this wonderful uh, opportunity, um, as well as, of course, um, Minara Chamber itself. Um, um, yes, I would like to extend uh, a warm salams and a welcome, uh, you know, to all of you, as well as the fellow speakers, as well as Her Royal Highness, Her Excellency. Um, yes, it is with absolute humility and humbleness that I am uh, sitting here tonight. Um, and um, yes, just to clarify a small topic uh, with Fosia is um, the, the book that I've written uh, is actually called Polygamy, Indiscreetly Adjudicated and Practiced. And if, if there's time in the Q&A later on, we can perhaps you know, unpack that topic a bit more, as well as if people want to know more about NLP, Neurosemantics Hypnotherapy. Uh, by all means, uh, because I wouldn't want to miss out on the opportunity to, to contribute to this very important topic that I was asked to speak on tonight, which uh, Fosia has very beautifully, you know, um, already said what it is about. 
and listening to Halima, the previous speaker, um, I cannot but emphasize my objective here tonight is as much as I want to talk about the women and mental health, when it comes to gender-based violence, we also need to consider the men folk. And that's why I hope my contribution here tonight in some of the insights and the tools that I wish to share and processes or little things people can do um, that is within their power to do um, will, will have an impact not only on the women, but also on the men and on our homes and our lives, because we know that the impact of the looting, the COVID, the pandemic, the, the loss of lives, the threat of more unrest has impacted all of us. And it has impacted us on a very, very personal level. So yes, as much as, as, as government has these policies and this legislation and all these different frameworks, which is fantastic and we need that, we also need to come to a place where we say, what do we have control over? In our personal little lives where we are at home or in our little offices or dealing with our kids, because ultimately we do not have control over what comes next. We do not have control if there's gonna be another wave, if there's a different strain of the, the virus that will come out, or if you're gonna get hijacked on the next corner or if looting will happen again. We really do not have that control over what's gonna happen next. But what we need to realize is what we do have control over. And this is what I really want us to start really taking in, is that we do have control over our thoughts, what we think, what we feel, and how we behave or what we do. And it is vital that we do not let that which is outside of us, all this negative stuff, the mayhem, the, the loss of lives, the pandemic, we must not let that outer landscape infiltrate and consume our inner landscape and this is why i'm saying we really need to take cognizance of what do we have control over and the only thing like i said is your thoughts your feelings and your behavior so very important is that we start to place a guard over our thoughts because when we think about something what we think causes us to feel a certain way. Now, to give an example, if we think, I'm not going to make this, this is so hard. When we think these thoughts, it obviously creates a certain feeling within us. And the more we think negative, the lower, the more stress, the more down we're going to feel. And of course, the effects of that is that we raise our stress hormones. And any doctor will tell us that when your stress hormones are raised for prolonged periods of time, it of course has a detrimental uh, effect on our immune systems. And that's the last thing we need in a time of a pandemic. So we, can, we have to step out of this vicious cycle. And I just want to unpack a little bit why this particular um, presupposition that we have in neurolinguistic programming um, is so important that what we think makes us feel a certain way. Now, if we look a little bit at um, the research in neuroscience, is that they say that all humans, and I think we all can agree with that, we all have an electromagnetic field or an auric field that we have around us that extends about three meters. Now, what happens? Um, the, how they discovered this is um, there was a study done where one of the scientists studied different eggs, reptilian eggs and bird eggs and all kinds of eggs. And they discovered that the top of the egg, there's a positive charge and the bottom of the egg, there's a negative charge. And that in itself creates an electromagnetic field because it's a living organism. So the same goes for humans. We too have that electromagnetic field. So how it works and why our thoughts is so important that we place a guard over it is your thoughts are the electrical charge that you send into the quantum field. And your feelings, your emotions 
is the magnetic charge that you then send into the, into the quantum field. So what you think and what you feel really broadcasts out into the energy, into the world out there, like a magnetic signature that influences everything in your life. So yes, this all sounds very technical, but in essence, your thoughts is what sends out a signal and your feelings is the magnetic field that draws that event back to you. So in other words, if you are constantly going to focus on the death rate, on all the difficulty around you, you are going to draw more of that inside of your being. So it is, of course, very difficult because it is all around us all of the time. But if we are not going to take certain measures and start taking simple basic steps that we can all do in our daily lives, we will become consumed and our immune systems will go and we will really fall into more despair and dis, dis ease and disease. So it is very, very important that we place a guard over our thoughts and we have to start practicing self-awareness and self-regulation when it comes to that. Because also, the more we draw in negativity into our innermost being and then ultimately extending that into our lives, we actually lose energy and we lose our personal power in all that's what's happening. And we cannot seem to create a different reality. So it's very, very important that self-awareness and, and self-regulation comes into play. And the next thing that I want to also um, bring into this is we need to realize that when we have this magnetic power, really, and, and electrical charge, we are so much more. Our soul's energy is so much more. Um, if we really want to come to a place, and this is very much where, where we can say we, where we really have to start looking at um, both the men and the women, all of us, is where does our self-worth lie? Because our self-worth, when you are in a, when you truly are in love with yourself, with when you have truly understood who you are and accepted who you are, and you've come to a place of self-love and self-compassion. Imagine the energy that you are then going to be projecting out into the world. Because we all know that, you know, the, uh, I know in the, in the biblical sense, we know that the, the teaching is love your neighbor as you love yourself. So there's, there's an absolute uh, um, sense that we have to have self-love so that when you have a true sense of your worth, of your value, of what you contribute. And it, like I said, it goes for men and women. When you're truly in that space of being in love with yourself, that is when you will truly start to honor and love the value in people around you. Because there's not a being created that does not have value. As anything that has life, even if we think of how the sun gives us sunlight and warmth, trees give us shade. So everything in nature is created in the benefit of the next thing in nature. And so we as humans, each and every one of us, have an extremely powerful source within us that we need to start to realize. We need to start to claim it and become that so that we can shift a lot of our internal landscape. Now, as ethnopsychology practitioners or as ethnopsychologists, of course, when it comes to mental health, we take a very broad, holistic approach to mental health in, in the sense that we look at the body, the mind, and the spirit. Of course, the body is the physical, the mind is the psychological, and then spiritually, we do believe um, in the spiritual forces around us. Um, for most people that, irrespective of which denomination you are, all of us know that they, for all of us that do believe, 
we know that there are demonic forces. We, we learn about jinn or jinn possession or demon possession. And so too do we believe in angels and a higher force. And when we can recognize that we have a spiritual connection to a divine creator that is much bigger than us, that is when this next step comes in. Because now we need to spiritually start to understand what is happening? We need to look with a spiritual eye. What is going on here? Because this is not just in a one particular area in the world. This is a global pandemic that we're talking about. So if we look with our spiritual eye, and if we, for example, take the looting that has happened, we need to ask ourselves from a spiritual perspective, what is the lesson that we need to take from this experience. Coming back to the example of the looting, as we're sitting here now, and yes, perhaps we can see each other on the, on the camera and so forth, but ideally when we relate with another human being, we cannot see our own face, but we see that person and they see our face. And yes, we actually tend to press each other's buttons because there are parts of us that we have disowned and there's parts of us that perhaps have been consumed by darkness. And if we look at the looting, we need to ask ourselves, what is this experience and this event reflecting back to us that where do we need to improve? Where do we need to change ourselves? And for many, yes, the, the card of racism came up. Now, in, a, in neurolinguistic programming, again, the presupposition is that we all have all the good and all the bad within us. So if we take, we all have a tendency of jealousy, envy, greed, racism, it's all just turned to different volumes. It's like a volume dial according to your conditioning, programming, how you were brought up. So it's very, very important that we start to do that introspection. We start to take, um, we start to acknowledge because only when we can acknowledge we are X, Y, or Z, can we start to say, how do we change it? What steps needs to be taken for us to turn down the volume on these on the negative traits that we have. Um, so again, the question is, what is the spiritual reasons? Because we need to polish the mirror of the soul um, that we need to take in, into cognizance. Then, of course, the other thing that, that we need to look at from a spiritual perspective coming to the looting is for many South Africans, they live in a lot of fear because many feel intimidated by the other. And I think more than anything, we need to look at the looting as the uniting force, how it showed us, how we as South African, no matter what race, color, not nationality you, you are, but it united the people that stand against crime. But it also showed us why, where are we falling short in helping the poor? In, in doing charity. So there's so many lessons that we can draw from this particular experience. But more than anything, coming back to, to the racist card, I, I truly feel that it is, it is time for us as the human race, starting with South Africa, because we have, you know, on top of the pandemic, we still had this looting as well, is we really have to start to see past the skin color of each other we really know, need to start seeing the soul of each and every human being. Because as the Islamic saying goes, is that do not humiliate anyone or anything for the innermost being of everyone and everything feels the same. In other words, even your dog or your cat, because that is the anything and the everything, they too, when you slap a cat or a dog or any other living being, 
they feel that sense of humility, of, of, of being humiliated. And so the more when we deal with other human beings. So we need to start seeing the soul aspect of who we are. And we need to honor the dignity with each and every human being that, that is there. So these are part of the, the introspection that we need to start doing. It is part of our personal reformation, moral regeneration, and spiritual reformation that we need to go through. Um, and I will, uh, I'm not sure how much time I've got left, but I quickly would like yeah. to just. We may have to stop you now. <laughs> you don't have my particular. But uh, I think you, you and, and Halima has made a fantastic contribution. And if it wasn't for this virtual, we can just sit and listen to you all the time. It's so, so interesting. Do you want to round up quickly or are you finished? Um, I will I will round up as quick as I can. Um, Please. Okay. So very quickly, when it comes to, um, again, continuing with the spiritual eye, looking at the pandemic, we really have to consider it from the divine, because if we are being placed in a spiritual training, in other words, we need to submit and accept we don't have control but we have a responsibility. And how else is the divine, the creator, going to prepare us spiritually for what lies ahead that might be 10 times worse if we are not put, are going to be put through the spiritual training of learning to have patience, of learning to trust and surrender our faith. And, and because for me, more than anything, we need to understand Part of this is to increase our faith in the faithfulness that the Almighty has towards us as his creation. And in conclusion, I will say, to get out of our heads and really into our hearts, we need to stop analyzing, stop trying to figure everything out. We rather need to make up our mind that we are not going to give up. We are going to push through with faith in our creator and hold on to our spiritual beliefs that will draw us closer to him. Because how else, not, if it's not through the reminder of death, will we draw closer as a human race and as souls to our creator? I thank you. Thank you, Adila. That was fantastic. What I like most is um, there are items that you can't control, but they, you need to take that control yourself. Place a guard on your thoughts. I like that. And what we make uh, of us, or, I mean, you know, the, the whole idea of self-regulation and self-awareness, if there's negativity, that's the way it's going to be manifested. Thank you very much. I think we, we learned a lot today from you as far as self-restraints and, and to take your inside and, and understand it more because that's the energy that you have and you give out. So yes, um, some of these things we have no control over, but Almighty is great. And I'm sure that um, uh, in future, if there's any other type of uh, uh, unrest or looting, we will be able to stand tall and understand you know, the ramifications of this and what we should do. In fact, we should, be, we should have started that long ago. Thank you so much, Adila. All right, so, thank you. So our next speaker is um, our Royal Highness, Princess Mukalile Zulu. It's so nice to have you, um, to see you today because uh, I think the last time we met was in the Chinese um, dinners, in the Chinese meetings, and you're always there. So thank you to, uh, to come over today and, and, I mean, to be part of our panel. And uh, I know Princess Zulu is very passionate uh, about spearheading the, the Sazi campaign. You know, um, She's the South African Sazi ambassador on women and girls, girl programs. 
So um, she, she's very passionate about spearheading that. And she encourages women and girls to draw on their inner strength. It's exactly what Adila has just told us about how you, uh, you draw from your inner strength and self-confidence to, to know yourself and what they stand for and guide their decisions about their future. It'll be lovely to listen to you, uh, uh, Royal, Royal Highness. And the topic that you have chosen is the impact of COVID and the recent unrest on rural um, uh, women, the jobs, the health, et cetera. What is being done and what can we women do uh, to rise above the challenges? Uh, it's a mighty uh, big task, I must say, what we women can do. But there's nothing we can't do as women. So, um, Your Highness, the floor is yours. Let's hear from you. Unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me, everybody? Yeah, you beautifully, and you're so beautiful. Thank you so much, Councillor Pierre. Sometimes I'm so tempted to almost say Mayor Pierre or Deputy Mayor Pierre or, or Vice President. So many <laughs> brands and labels and responsibilities. It goes to say how much work you do um, yeah. in contributing oh, to making our country better. And thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Um, but thank you as well. I think I'd like to take this opportunity to say um, and extend my appreciation for the fact that Dr. Halima reached out to me. I know given the circumstances, um, maybe people were somewhat concerned about would I be available to be able to participate on such a platform. But because it's something that is second nature to me, that is something that matters to me, because immediately when the conversation has to do with anything or in any way that a woman's life can be made better, then mine is to say, I definitely have something to contribute and I want to actively participate in trying to be part of the solution or having the ability to link women from different spheres. Um, to be able to connect them to the relevant people that can make their lives better. And specifically with this topic, um, it was about the impact of COVID on rural, uh, rural uh, women, as well as the recent unrest. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on the recent unrest because I believe that somehow it is interlinked or is a reaction to the impact of COVID on the rural communities and the women at large. So I just would like to touch on various aspects um, with regards to exactly what many of you may not know um, if you haven't been to a rural area. Women happen to be the backbone move forward in any sort of way or um, have the ability to make their circumstances better or to improve the lives of various communities, households, all according to an ecological model, um, which will eventually reach to society and the world at large. So um, we know in our communities that women already started at a deficit because um, as one of the speakers, Dr. Halima said, as well as Adila also said, that um, women happen to be second when there are decision-making processes. They may not necessarily be well represented when the platform deems the opportunity to be able to voice the areas of concern. And I think that the impact of COVID speaks to basic needs that were already issues or that were already issues that were bubbling under 
in our country, our beautiful country, our democratic country, that basically has been dealing with for the longest time trying to address issues of just basic needs and poverty and inequality. And I think for the longest time, it's been a conversation that has been had um, with lots of strategies being put in place. I think many leaders trying to perhaps put systems together to be able to say, well, these are the interventions or possible ways of trying to remedy the situation. However, I don't feel that the voice of women has been heard loud enough. And I think that in terms of COVID, let me perhaps paint a picture of what the life of most rural women is like, okay? So let's say, for example, there's a main town, they travel far and wide, far and wide, the terrain is not all that great. And um, schools are quite far apart or far away from home. And um, as well as the very apparent reality that women are the ones that basically head the household, unless of course it is a child headed house. Um, so just to paint that very basic picture, this is what will then allow me to move forward with regards to showing the impact of it. So if we look at what happened at the very beginning of COVID last year within a very specific period, um, which was between um, the end of March to perhaps mid to the end of April. That was just immediate change to women um, where they were told wherever you are, or basically all of us actually as a whole, as, as people of citizens of the country of stay where you are for a period that you don't know for how long, that already has negative implication on you psychologically as an individual, because now we had women who already were dealing with responsibilities and burdens on their shoulders of ensuring that there's well being or the lives of their children are not susceptible to risk, with the hope that their husbands may come. Um, because this also came at a time where it was, I think it was the Easter weekend that was that was quite close. And we found that these male figures or their partners were not in close proximity of where they were. So we found that at a later stage over a period of time that um, some men had had children with not their immediate partners or um, what we also found was that after having been locked in, like on lockdown for a very long period, we found that children that had been going to school or had not been able to go to school um, found that because there are issues of poverty in our areas or specifically in rural areas, in some areas it's more apparent than others, you find that with the, for example, there's a feeding scheme which is specific to, um, to schools, specifically primary schools and as well as secondary schools, which is high school, where you find that those children appreciate going to school because that's their only chance to get that one meal because they can't guarantee the luxury that we have that requires us to be able to do so much more because they don't know where they may get the next meal or if they'll even get it. So them going to school or not going to school was also an issue because COVID contributed to that. As well as just that uncertainty of the women and the pressure that they had with regards to their partners. Others happen to have been living with their partners, but the issue of having a sense of going to work or having your partner go to work and not being stuck in the same place um, for long or extensive periods of time also then was one thing that gave them freedom with their partners and allowed them to perhaps even go to water as an opportunity to go and have conversations with women in the community. Now, what you found because of lockdown was that they were forced to stay with their partners that they initially never lived with or hardly ever um, stayed with. They were the children as well, they in the household. 
So this contributed to a number of things. So just to also give you indication of the kind of arrangement that you sometimes find in traditional families is that you find that there are many houses in the same yard. So you'll find that you have an uncle, you have maybe a brother. It's basically an intergenerational setup. And I understand that, and I hope that this is not offensive, but I understand that some Indians also live that way, which too contributes to making families stronger or strengthen, so to say. But in our environment, where you find that as Africans, you find that that is where it becomes a place where children become susceptible to abuse, where you have issues of GBV, where you then have IPV as well, intimate partner violence, um, where you're dealing with rape, you're dealing with incest even, and you're dealing with unplanned pregnancy here. So, you know, I, I really think that COVID has posed such an issue for us that makes con uncomfortable conversations really, really for forced to have to happen. And I don't think if we're, I don't know if we're having the right conversations as women, representing women, and also speaking to women in leadership that can then echo the sentiments of women who don't have a voice or who feel that their areas of concern are not being addressed. Um, then with the recent unrest, I said I didn't really want to dwell so much upon it because I think that it was a response. I don't think in any way it was political as such. It was a response that was an action that speaks to showing us where we are as a country and all the things that we don't do right in terms of the beneficiaries that are supposed to be the ones that reap the benefits of the services delivery that they're supposed to receive. Now, for example, let's just give you an instance. Like one of the speakers said, is that some of the women were taking food, some of the males were taking material possessions like fridges, maybe beds perhaps, and they know for their reasons. But that goes to show you that women prioritize nutrition well-being, um, livelihoods, the value of community, they value and, in, and want to ensure that the family unit is sustained. And if for one thing, if we're trying to sort the issue of poverty out, I think that as a country we are failing dismally because according to the sustainable, the sustainable development goals, and I think it's the first one, it says that we're trying to end, and this is countries all over the world, we're trying to end poverty as in where we may see it. So I think that there are a number of issues that we need to address as community, at community level. I think we need to hold our leaders accountable. I think that it's important that things that affect women need to be addressed by women. And the recommendations that I have, and I mean, I don't want to take away from the reality that government has, has come forward with certain ways to address the impacts of COVID. And while it may be monetary, I don't think it's anything that takes our, our country forward or changes the narrative as such. Because I thought, right, so what are the ways that we can do something as women in the rural areas. Agriculture is, is a great way to consider, to have women be part of the process. They must grow their food, they must sell their food, and they must trade and exchange or barter. Whatever will work where there is circulation of wealth within a community, because when you look at the logistic implications, then you have to look at fuel. That is what actually increases the, the cost of food to the people that actually grew it in the particular area. So I think the conversations then need to change. I think that um, we can't expect government to do everything. I think that all of us have a responsibility, whether it be traditional leaders or whether it be just about even myself, 
just looking beyond the palace walls and realizing that the situation is a dire situation that requires intervention or would be a conversation with you knowing who to speak to, who can make something great happen. Um, this platform, I don't believe is, is one to make yourself look good, but you know, distribute, distribution of food parcels is one. Yes, that is what we did. That was great, but that is temporary. That's a temporary intervention that doesn't say that, well, you can give a, a three tins of baked beans or pull charts or 2,5 kg maize meal or whether it be rice of 2 kg. But that is a meal probably for a family for one day. What then? And we need to ask ourselves, what is it that we can do? And also another thing that you need to realize about women, specifically in rural areas, is that they lost their jobs. Or let's rather say the jobs were on hold because in this area, it's no, they don't have work that is specific to, that allows them um, to work with technologically advanced systems where they can work remotely, like maybe perhaps all of us. They need to be there in the field or they need to sell their fruit next to the road or in their food stalls in main town where there is foot flow. And now imagine reflecting on a year ago of where there was limited movement. Where or what plan did they have to put, did they have to then put in place to be able to make ends meet? Because they're not like us. They don't have insurance. They can barely even have like health services. They're at the mercy of what is offered to them, which is hardly ever enough. Even their level of education contributes because they don't have a plan B, they don't have savings because they're just trying to survive and just get through the day and get through the week perhaps and plan for the next week with what they've been able to accumulate probably this week. So I do think that um, we need to hold our leaders accountable. I included, because it's all about what can you do with what you have? And then who can you touch base with to be able to establish who then can come on board because everybody needs to eat, is that not so, I presume. But then again, the people that are supposed to benefit from the experiences are the ones that are supposed to benefit indeed. And they need to have the guidance with the knowledge and the technology that other people in other areas may have. And I think it's important to link um, urban areas and rural areas, because I feel like even when a budget is designed, I feel like there's exclusion already. And who better to tell you about the issues or challenges that they face, but women themselves. So um, <laughs> there's a lot that can be done. I think a woman's movement and not one that is just about ideas that is action-based, that needs to have something that is very clear to how to go upon implementation, following up, measuring through the m &E systems that are put in place and actually have people that care about the people that are suffering because it's not just a humanitarian issue. It's also a financial issue when you're dealing with COVID and the negative ripple effects of it. I can see files up here. I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I missed you there for a second. I couldn't hear you. I said we have such dynamic speakers and there's so much of knowledge imparted and time is such a problem as, as well. And um, I wish that we could meet face to face to put everything into action, what you have said tonight, because it's very, very important. 
Um, the very fact that you know you you pointed out that of course you acknowledge relief efforts uh, given by private sector and and all of us uh, to assist um, you know in in such public uh, you know that are going through socioeconomic crisis because of the pandemic and other reasons. I, I still feel and I, and and you are correct that government has to do much more. <clears throat> but the very fact that government doesn't have the money, you know, and uh, that's another vital factor. Where is the money going? So um, maybe the National Development Plan should, on the agenda, place rightfully all the barriers that are facing women um, with regards to entering the job market and also the very fact that uh, implementation of uh, variety measures in order to monitor them to make sure that women are, are, are always kept in a consistent economic uh, way. Um, I really loved your, your topic and what you have spoken to your highness. And I'm praying that one day we meet together to say that yes, the big question, what can we do together? I'm sure uh, we can do a lot. And we women must uh, place it on board that we will. And I will need you to, to set the, this goal going forward. And I'm sure we would. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have, um, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Yashwanti Ngidi, uh, our most famous facilitator, motivational speaker, and I would say um, an educator as well, and a lecturer. And of course, we know her for, for very many years. And, you know, one could just get stuck into <clears throat> uh, Ashwampia's uh, discussions because she takes you far away, you know. So the topic that uh, you have chosen is social cohesion. And that is the most, I would say, appropriate topic that we with the unrest and the looting and all that has come out in the Phoenix area that uh, has given public and international um, a view that there was some sort of racism that was uh, seen there, which I doubt very well, but we can't say. So your whole concept of social cohesion is so important to that of what uh, Halima had said and uh, Adila and that of uh, your highness, that when we put all this together today, it can bring so much of live energy that we can now give out to our people that need it, who are in socioeconomic deprivation that uh, uh, the pandemic has caused. So uh, Dr. Ngidi, let's hear from you. So you will my sister. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and greetings to here to be on this platform. Um, you know, Sisposia, you and I have been on so many amazing platforms. And as I sat here and I'm listening to my amazing panelists, I thought to myself, you know, I really want COVID to be over now. It's enough. Because you want to engage the spirit, the warmth of the presentation. You want to engage the women who have given so many thoughts. So having been very actively involved with the cleanup process of the, the unrest and the rioting and whatever we want to label it, one of the things that I came back with, uh, you know, as an appointed national social cohesion advocate for this country is that I came with three words, reflect, reconnect, and redirect. And, and so I, in my mind, I, I say as a duty as Africans in KZN, we must reflect on the state of our continent, but most importantly, let me go there and say, 
we must reflect on the state of our homes, our community, our district, our province, our country, and our continent and the place we play in the world. Our responsibility as women, as women leaders, as women in a place of influence is that we must reconnect with the communities, reconnect with ourselves, especially where we are situated as the Institute of Africology in the rural areas. I urge us that we must also redirect our energies, you know, full time, full throttle, as, as they will say, we must redirect our energies and our efforts on youth and children. We must, and I'm happy that Halima is the strategist that is respected by women who are working in different areas, where I'm, I'm really for that we must redirect our strategies, you know, redirect how we put our energies in working together on conflict resolution. In the greater scheme of things, we must remember our obligation is to do more, not less, to build KZN. And to build the KZN that we desire, we must look to ourselves as women, always without doubt, to the for the solutions of inclusivity. And we must spread the benefits of cohesiveness. One of the things that I had to do while I traveled to the different places from Blackburn to Bryadine to Mount Clare to Mdoni, all these places, one of the things that I thought about was how do we really break down the issue of the nation building? How do we break down the issue of we are trying to build a moral nation, not just any nation, we are trying to build a moral nation. And, and today in KZN, our challenge as women is that to ask our questions such as, are we true to this historic mission of taking KZN, South Africa, Africa to a higher place? Are we ready for that historic mission? You know, uh, as we know, and our speaker spoke about, we talk about displacement of women. You know, when you listen to the noise and, and, and the comments on the radio stations, you wanna turn your radio off, but you know, because you are in it, you're gonna have to listen to the ills and the evils that women all over in South Africa are facing. We are yet to achieve a socially cohesive KZN. And so faced with these challenges, women today have to decide on what legacy are we going to be leaving our children, our homes, when we go our, to our ancestral realm. Vision 2030 in this city of KZN, as you will know, uh, Councillor Fozia, is that the province should effectively learn from the lessons of the past, that is xenophobia. The province should build on progress that is now on the way and be transparent about the lessons and the weakness of the progress. The province and, 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 and not just Durban in particular must ensure that the positive socioeconomic transfer information really has its teeth in not just the grassroots, but in the townships, in areas that we dare not shred. I am a big believer in Agenda 2063 because we have become so insular in South Africa that we forget that we belong to a bigger plan of action for cohesiveness. And at the heart of Agenda 2063, it emphasizes the importance of rekindling the passion for pan-Africanism, a sense of unity, a sense of self-reliance, a sense of integration and solidarity. And that has to be our clarion call as women leaders, as women in places of influence. Agenda 2063 looks forward by embracing the unfinished business of the past. African unity on the ground here in our homes, in our communities, in our KZN is what we are wanting. And we want it in its totality. We want it in the economics. We want it in the education. We want it in the boardrooms. We want that unfinished business to be finished by us. People of KZN and women of KZN must remember and tell the children of the bigness of who we are. 
and, and, and understand that we come from something, almost our story, the history of where we've come from, even to today, still has not been told in its context by women and what we have achieved in overcoming. As I thought about my, pres my presentation and, uh, and, and you know, what, what we, are, we are trying to deal with now for the progress, you know, I, I, can't, I cannot overemphasize that we are intrinsically linked to each other. We have to depend on our environment to sustain us. It is not just the status of our economies, the size of the wallets and the age of content that define us as Af Africans. But here in KZN, here in South Africa, we are defined by our humaneness, by our humanity, by our Ubuntu. And so at the level of the country, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, 1996, Act 1018, directly using the concept of social cohesion, speaks about entrenching the principles of non-racialism and non-discrimination. And, and that act in itself confirms that we are on a quest for reconciliation and nation building. What is this social cohesion that we talk about? It is the predominant characteristic of the post-1994 attempts at social cohesion that we are focused on, especially the issues of racism. And to a lesser extent, we focus on class and, and skin color, but we know that it exists. We know that there, there are disparities in our own family members, in our own communities that we still have not spoken about. So when we get it out in the open, we, we tend to want to deal with external factors, but we forget the internal factors. Apartheid as a reference point limits to, tends to limit our understanding of the extent to which we must define social cohesion in South Africa. We must perhaps know who must be socially coerced in order to achieve social coercion to have equality. And the unity of the nation must never be comprom compromised. And, and I really mean, you know, the job that Pose, Councilor Pose, you're doing, Halima, uh, Alia, Princess Ndabizita, you know, the work that you are doing must be one that cannot be compromised. And it's something that we must act off as a principle. In closing, social cohesion does not seek to build one homogeneous nation out of a number of people. In fact, it recognizes and encourages the diversity of the parts that form the whole. Social cohesion activism must first show the way of including others. It is not something that you read in the book, it is something that you do. Ubuntu is a verb. It is not something that you read, it is something that you do. The journey to a nation of work, building all peoples. We need a common principle that is inviting, we need a common principle that is in, 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 in enabling. At the Institute of Africology, we go by the Nguza Saba principles. The first is Umoja unity, to strive and maintain unity in the family, community, and nation. The second is Kujitakulia, self-determination, to define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. The third is Ujima, collective work and responsibility. It asks that we build and maintain our communities together and make our brother and sister's problems our own problems and we solve them together. Imani, to believe with all our hearts in our people, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness of the work that we are doing towards a cohesive nation. Ujama, cooperative economics, to build and maintain our own institutions, our stores, our businesses, and to profit from them together. <clears throat> and my favorite in closing is Nia, which means purpose. To make our collective vocation, the building and the developing of our community in order to restore our people to dignity, purpose, and its greatness. We must remember that in everything that we do, there is Kumba, creativity to do as much as we can in the way we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited. It is not okay that women 
tell me that they are going into communities and they're gonna tell women and young girls, don't sleep around, don't go to a man, and then you jump in your car and go to your, your nice cozy comfort. But you're not telling them that there are certain things that has to be put in place for them to get the courage for them to be able to walk out of the situation. And we have failed a lot of these women. So we have to bridge the, the gap. We must reject the old adage that one's gain is the other's loss and winner takes all. We must agree that the gap between rich and poor, rich and poor women, especially in our province, is not only unfair, it is unjust and it is un unsustainable. We must bridge the gap with collaboration, unity in diversity is the basis for a win-win. We need to approach this with creativity and collaboration. We must invite other women into this, into this story and broaden this conversation. Thank you so much for having me here. I really look forward to the discussions and the feedback from those who have been listening. We will win, Womandla. Amandla, alhamdulillah, with all the wonderful words that you have given with friend and, and affirmation, we're so proud of you. Social cohesion, according to Dr. Giri, is that we must include everyone to be to a cohesive nation. That's important to restore dignity amongst our people. Ma'am, you should be the president of our country because you speak so well. Beautiful, thank you so much. You know, when I listen to all the women and I think to myself, our history abounds with fierce women who refuse to take a step backwards. We together with all South African women are the descendants of these and countless other powerful women. So when you hear, heard them tonight, you can see that they are revolutionary thinkers. And I, we are so proud of all of you that the attitude you have manifested today clearly uh, in, in, in your comprehensiveness guides us to a milestone of advancing women's rights in all spheres uh, that we are living in. So ladies, I don't think we are going to have time for questions, although it was part of the agenda because we're running short of time. And I think, Amina, can you direct us that uh, we are now in the closing phase, phase now. And unfortunately, we won't be able to uh, take any questions in as much I would have loved to uh, um, uh, take in a few we, we are getting some messages that we have insightful speakers and they have enjoyed every bit of it and i want to leave you with this thought of what madiba had said and i quote that um after climbing one great hill there are many more hills to climb so ladies we haven't climbed all the hills and I hope and pray that we are not stuck in some or, or allowing men to leave us or, or, or uh, not to allow us to move forward. But we need all of you with such good thinking. And, and, and this has made our evening so, uh, you know, um, I would say um, potential in all the thoughts that we have had tonight. I'm waiting for this pandemic to go so I can meet all of you face to face. We sit on the drawing board and we say we are the women and we are now going to take this torch and move forward. Thank you very much. Amina, do we have time for questions or we are over? Uh, we can round up now. I think there is uh, some people have other commitments at eight as well. Okay. So I rounded up by thanking everyone, all our speakers, our most insightful speakers, and we are getting lots of messages uh, to that effect. I, I really am not so smart in reading those things, but uh, I mean, I don't know if you can see those messages. I'm just learning all these virtual things now. 
Uh, so ladies, um, can you all give us your last few words and then we close up. I don't want to just stop by uh, uh, me giving, uh, telling you the final uh, uh, word. But uh, let's start with Halima, your final few words uh, to the women out there and to the people out there. Yeah, um, I think for me, it's time to get on the ground and work together towards, um, you know, um, building our country. Obviously, we understand the gaps and there's a lot of work to be done. And I would really um, 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 feel that from this forum, we must communicate thereafter one area that we are going to get involved in and take forward so that there is action after this particular briefing or discussion. Thank you. And thanks to all the speakers for their very insightful and, and important points that they have made. Thank you, Halima. Thank you so much. We are getting messages from ladies who are saying that they would love to join us if, once the pandemic is over and we, are get, we get into this face-to-face. -face. Let's we women get together. Now, I don't have your details, but if you know me and my phone number, please contact me to say that you want to be part of that. Our first item of discussion was the bakery that Halima put forward. It's a challenge she puts forward to all the women out there that at the time of the unrest, people were asking, we have a women's uh, chat group. We all, even I was one of them who asked for um, bread recipe. And I was so successful. I don't, I'm not good in baking, but the bread was really good. So um, for my husband to eat it, I'm sure uh, he passed it as good bread making. So we are now going to embark on uh, having these uh, um, uh, small time bakery bread making in every ward and, and uh, that will allow for sustainability. Yeah, lovely. So um, um, our next speaker was uh, Adila, your final few words. Zakula. Um, yes, I, I cannot but echo um, Halima's words, um, you know, how we must all draw together and come together as a collective. Um, and not only, you know, do we, do we just need to do our own individual thing, but as a collective, we need to become very clear as to what is our vision, what exactly is it that we want to achieve in the first place, so that we all on the same page, we all you know, project our energy and our work towards the same goal, because from the vision, we're going to set our different goals. Then we need to look at our strategies, how we're going to achieve these different goals. And of course, implementation, implementation, implementation is the key because we need to make physical change in the lives of people on the grass or on grassroots level from the economics to the physical, to the mental, to the spiritual, as a collective, I believe if we have all the right people and we all can contribute, it is not just us as speakers, it is for all of us, each and every one of us have a purpose and we all can contribute. So I thank you so much for being part of this. I, um, I'm so humbled and I'm, I'm so excited as I'm sitting here. I really look forward to, to us working together and taking this forward because we've, we can do this. Thank you so much, everybody. Well, with your energy, we definitely will. And Inshallah. Uh, Highness, can we get your final few words? Unmute yourself. Um, thank you very much. I'm really... Um, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity that was bestowed to me tonight. And I think what made, what gets me very excited is the fact that um, I finally found a network of women that actually think the way that I do. And nothing is more refreshing than that. And I want to just say thank you so much for the work that you do. And um, may God continue to bless it. Because I know that it contributes significantly in a way that can definitely take this country forward, that can take this continent forward and contribute significantly to who we are as a human race. And to actively participate and make a decision to do so means that we're on the right path. 
I know that some areas may seem very bleak right now, um, or it may seem like a mammoth task, but the fact is we have everything that we, that we need within ourselves. And also we all are connected with a network and array of people that can help us achieve what it is that we have in mind. And we need to just be very positive in our thinking. We need to be very vicious in our approach and stoppable and really, really shake things up and also make our counter, our male counterparts come to the party to come and support things that are for women, by women, and um, that will also be an investment even in their daughters that happen to be up and coming leaders. And I think that we too have a very important role to play with regards to that. Um, and I really, really am excited to be a part of something so exciting. Um, I can't wait till we look back on something like this on our coming together just tonight, maybe in a year or maybe even in five years um, and just as, a, an absolute um, and basically establishing what it is that we would have done because I can see that we're the right people. There's no one else that can take responsibility for the things that we need to get done for ourselves. So may God bless this union. I'm really, really excited and I'm very honored and humbled to be a part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we're gonna make sure that you're gonna be part of this union. <laughs> it's gonna be after this, don't forget. And our final Dr. Didi, um, your final words, ma'am. Is it the unmute story? <laughs> Let's see if she's still around. Uh, Mualima, uh, Alima, you are on. I see you want to say a few words quickly. I don't think uh, Dr. Giddy is All right, our relationship is- All right, peace be upon you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity, Sister Fosia. Uh, ladies, I believe and gentlemen too, this is a clarion call for us as citizens to stand up in solidarity with our shared humanness to ensure that every human is living as good as each and every one of us. To do that, we need to start from the ground up, for we are all off the ground, therefore we can only build from the The stratification of human beings must stop and it begins with us to stop it. The inequality is what puts us where we are. So with prayer, with faith, and with patience, let us overcome it and bring all the people of the Almighty on a level playing ground so that tomorrow no one can be abused by any in order to fulfill nefarious acts we should be ashamed with the kind of the constitution that we've got. And until women stand up, it will not change. Peace be upon you. Thank you very much. Well said. Uh, anyone uh, would like to say a few words from uh, those that are uh, on the, who have actually joined us? Any one of you would like to say a few words? I see there's Yasmin, Wahida, Chandi, Safia, um, Nozipo, Marion, Lisle. Any one of you would want to say a few words? No, I'm closing. <laughs> no one. Okay, thank you very much. But please, if you want to join us, uh, make contact and we would definitely uh, uh, put that union together of women and we have a challenge uh, to take that uh, Halima has put forward 
and obviously we have to run with it. Thank you very much. This is on behalf of the Minara Chamber of Commerce. I want to say thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening. And I think it was one of the best ever uh, discussion that we had on Women's Month and closing the month for this uh, in this few days. Uh, one would say that uh, uh, the challenges are great and uh, we have to make sure that we uh, do something for uh, our community. I see Wahida's hand is up. Um, uh, Wahida, you want to say a few words quickly? Yes, assalamu alaikum. Hi to everyone. Um, amazing session, <laughs> mind blowing. Um, so I just wanted to say that I'm actually this is a session that I was looking for, something that I needed um, because I'm trying to turn my business towards empowering women and empowering abused women and kids. Um, of course, I don't know all the avenues that I need to go through and all of that, which I am still learning. Um, but if there's any way that I could get into contact with you guys, could get some guidance on how to go about it, would that be possible? Yes, of course. Uh, you must contact Amina, our administrator. She's a very astute uh, woman and uh, she will take you through. And maybe also if you can join Minara, um, that would be even better. Thank you, Wahida. Anyone else? <laughs> Thank you. And, and good luck to uh, what you are planning to do. I'm sure it's going to work well. I can also assist you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm closing now. Thank you very much, everyone. And this is Fozia finally saying um, goodbye and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Well,